we were looking at Spanish art and we looked at the kind of golden age in the 16th, 17th century. We jumped to the 20th century with Salvador Dali and we looked at how he kind of um, reimagined Spanish history. But there was this big chunk in the middle that I mentioned, the 19th century, um, which doesn't get much attention in Spanish art. Um, so, and the, the reason why it gets no attention in Spanish art history is because France is really dominating in the 19th century in terms of the art world. Um, obviously with the Impressionist movement, which lots of people are familiar with, but also with Orientalist painting, which is what we're going to talk about today. So hopefully you can all see this. This is Napoleon visiting the plague stricken at Jaffa from 1804. And this is the painting that we're going to start with. So we can't jump straight into Spain. We have to start with France because France is like the hub for Orientalist painting. And the reason for that is because even like politically, France is thought to have um, first started colonizing the Middle East. So in, um, I'll just check the WhatsApp. I am recording for those asking. Um, so yeah, this will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, so yeah, so France uh, started off this trend of colonizing the Middle East in 1788, I think that's the wrong date actually, let me check my notes, 1798, when uh, Napoleon sent a load of troops to Syria and um, essentially Syria and Egypt were the main places. The reason why they did that is because they were trying to block Britain's access to India. So there were all sorts of political motivations. Um, but what we're going to be focusing on is the impact that this political event had on the arts. Um, and this is really the, the painting that most people start with when you're looking at this period. So, um, yeah, so France lost this battle with, uh, you know, trying to conquer Syria and Egypt because Britain teamed up with um, the Ottoman Empire to try and stop France from invading successfully. So France lost, but if you look at the painting that you have on the screen, you wouldn't necessarily think that France lost this battle because when Napoleon returned, he decided he wanted to use art to um, brand himself as a successful invader. Um, he really understood the power of art as propaganda. And if you look at his portraits, um, he really makes himself look like um, the kings and queens of history, even though he was uh, an emperor. So he really adopted a lot of um, the tropes of royal portraiture to make himself look more powerful. And this is a great example of that. So firstly, in this painting, if you zoom in, which we'll do on this slide, in the background, in the very middle of the painting, there is a French flag on top of this burning building, um, which <laughs> makes the, the whole event look like a success for France, which it really wasn't. It was a massive failure. Um, and if you zoom in further onto Napoleon himself, I'm sorry, this isn't a very good reproduction, but you'll see that um, all of the people who surround him are covering their mouths um, because they're in this plague stricken mosque. And that's one of the reasons why France wasn't successful in this invasion. Um, because so many troops uh, were killed by this plague. So all of the uh, generals around Napoleon are covering their mouths, really scared about this plague. But Napoleon is shown to be, you know, totally fearless. Um, he reaches out and he even touches one of the people who has the plague. So he's meant to be shown as this hero, this total hero. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's a lie, it's propaganda, but nonetheless, it was very effective at the time. And there's more um, techniques that Napoleon uses to like really enhance his godliness in this painting. Um, everyone 
in different parts of the painting is turning to look at him so that he's really the main focus of attention and the whole outside of the painting is in a shadow and he is like lit up um, in a really Christ-like way. This is really typical of religious painting so he really adopts that as well. And then um, one of the things that I find most interesting is that the artist actually decides to put him in the same um, position as the Apollo Belvedere, this really famous Greek sculpture that we looked at maybe in the second or third week when we were talking about sculpture. Um, and we, you know, we mentioned that Greek sculptures have all these connotations of um, democracy, power, empire. Um, and this was really purposeful because you have to remember that academic artists were studying Greek sculpture. So they really purposefully copied these um, poses. So yeah, there's a million things that Napoleon does to try and make this invasion look successful. And I've just included this image here so that you can get a sense of um, the scale of this painting in the Louvre. It's absolutely huge, which again, just adds to the, the propaganda-ness of it, if that's even a word. I will just, yeah, this, this painting basically, um, is where you can start to see um, like the beginnings of Orientalist painting. Uh, so the artist who had actually, the artist who painted this had never been to Egypt, but he copied um, Egyptian architecture from the sketchbooks of the artists that Napoleon had taken with him on his voyage. And this is a really important thing about the beginning of colonization in the Middle East is that European powers and European generals took artists with them and the artists made sketches and they came back and these uh, sketches and drawings started to establish trends among European artists who had never even been to the Middle East. Um, so, you know, from the very, very beginning of colonization in the Middle East, art was hugely important. And I just remembered that I included this slide here because one of Napoleon's soldiers actually found in Egypt the Rosetta Stone, which is this really famous um, stone for uh, the study of Egypt, whether you're a historian or art historian. Um, yeah, it totally changed what everyone understood as ancient Egyptian history. Um, and eventually this actually ended up in the British Museum. So lots of the things that French and British um, and Spanish sometimes so soldiers found while they were beginning to colonize the Middle East in the 19th century um, ended up in the British Museum. And this is another one of these really contentious things um, and repatriation issues, which we often talk about in this class. But I won't uh, go into that today because we have a lot to get through. Um, I am going to try and make the class a little shorter so there's more time for questions. So do feel free to like pop up with questions anytime. Um, yeah, so these artists, um, the ones uh, who, who went with him, um, basically started inspiring artists who'd never been, like the one you're seeing here. And, um, you know, even though the painting that we're looking at was a failure politically, it was a massive success uh, artistically. And later on in the 19th century, when France um, continued its colonization of the Middle East, um, just like many other European powers at the time, um, the trend for the sort of Orientalist tropes that you're seeing in this painting just got more and more and more popular. Which brings me on to the kind of second artist that we're going to talk about, which is Delacroix. I hope you can see um, the label here. So this is now in a different part of the world. We've moved away from Egypt because in 1830, so 30 years later, France conquered um, Algeria. And again, it sent artists with its political troops. And one of the artists that it sent was actually Delacroix. 
um, who is most famous for his romantic paintings, but he did lots of Orientalist paintings as well. Um, and this was one of them, Women of Algeria. Uh, this is a really famous Orientalist painting because it's seen as one of the earliest in this style. Um, we're going to come back to this painting though, so I'm not going to talk too much about it now. So I've included a map here just to show you um, that basically by the end of the 19th century, so you know in the hundred years after Napoleon first tried to colonize Syria and Egypt, um, European colonization was basically a mess. Uh, so many European powers were trying to do the same thing and um, it just got too much. So basically what happened is that they decided to do um, a big political gathering in 1882, I think it is, although let me just check my notes. Um, yeah, 1882, they did a big political gathering, which went on to be called the Scramble for Africa, where they basically divided uh, all the territories in Africa amongst the different European powers that were trying to conquer Africa and the Middle East. Um, and it's a sad moment really, because before 1882, before the scramble for Africa, um, I think it may have been 1884 actually, but I'll just have to check after the class. Um, before this moment, Africa was a relatively independent continent. And after 1882, 90% um, of it was actually, uh, colonized by Europe. So on this map on the right hand side, I hope you can see it, this is post um, 1882, what we're going to be focusing on is the blue and the yellow because the blue represents France and the yellow represents Spain and we're actually going to be zooming in on this corner uh, in North Africa looking mainly at um, Algeria and Morocco. But this just gives you a sense of what was happening politically and this had a huge impact on the arts and we're basically going to be studying that impact today. Um, and I've also included these three images just to show you that by the end of the 19th century when this had been going on for a hundred years, um, Orientalism was not just infiltrating painting but also uh, advertising. So advertising and visual culture. So it starts to pop up everywhere basically um, and there's still remnants of this today um, but you know looking at these adverts you'll be able to see by the end of the class how similar they are and how much they take from orientalist paintings and it also had a huge influence uh, on architecture so I will briefly talk about this although we will be coming back to this this is um, the Spanish pavilion of 1878 Throughout the 19th century, from 1851 onwards, some of you may know that um, Britain, France, Spain, and various other nations were doing international exhibitions together, roughly every 10 or 11 years. And they were basically huge exhibitions, often in Paris, but sometimes in Barcelona, sometimes in Philadelphia in the US, where every nation would build a pavilion to represent itself and fill it with items that they felt best showed off their nation. And um, basically, uh, these exhibitions were hugely important for colonialism because um, lots of nations used it to kind of show off what their colonies, uh, what they had looted from their colonies. Um, and it's just interesting to me that Spain actually uses Oriental Orientalist architecture in 1878 to kind of represent itself. Um, but you see Orientalist architecture everywhere. Also, some of you in the UK may have seen the, um, I can't remember its name, it's in Brighton. I haven't included a picture of it, but the big uh, palace in Brighton that also uses Orientalist architecture. So you really do see it everywhere in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, so yes, it happens in advertising, it happens in architecture, but what we're going to be focusing on is um, it, the way that it happened in painting. The Brighton Pavilion, apparently it's called. Yeah, okay, great. So people are familiar with it. Um, and I, I actually haven't seen it in person, but I, from what I remember, I think it's Indian, um, 
Indian inspired architecture because Orientalist architecture is never very authentic, but um, I think that it's the case which would make sense because obviously the UK um, was colonizing India at the time. So yeah, Orientalism is always connected in some way to the um, colonial history that surrounds it. So what actually happened with painting? Because I could do a whole thing on Orientalist architecture, but I always talk for too long, so <laughs> we will just focus on um, painting. So we're now in the later half of the 19th century, you know, 60 years after the first painting that we looked at in Egypt. And now that colonization is such a widespread political trend, artists uh, really jump onto this. It becomes more and more popular. And they start looking back to those early um, colonial missions and really romanticizing them. Um, so here you've got Napoleon in Cairo, and here you've got the same thing, Napoleon in Cairo. Um, it's a, it becomes a kind of obsessive theme in France, looking back to this failed French battle and really romanticizing it like they had in the beginning. Um, and this is a, a good time to um, talk about Jerome because of both of the paintings that we've looked at here are by the same artist and he basically becomes like the most famous orientalist painter of the 19th century of all time really um, and people really copy his style so when you look at his paintings you can get a really good sense of what the typical traits of orientalist painting are so you can see that it's very um, lifelike um, you know, extremely academic, uh, like very flat surface, really technical, um, but also super romantic um, and really uh, obsessed with kind of landscape and textiles, all this kind of thing. And the reason why um, the hallmarks of the Orientalist style are so interesting, I included this here, is because um, they're so different to what we usually associate the late 19th century with because impressionism is like the most famous art historical movement of this time but it happens at exactly the same time as orientalist painting so i've included these two images here um, so that you can see they were both painted in the same year um, one of them is in the impressionist style one of them is in um, the Orientalist style, they're both painted in France as well, and they're just incredibly different in subject matter. Um, one is extremely tied to political events and the other really isn't. Um, the style of painting, like the brush strokes, everything is different. Um, and the reason why these styles contrast so much is because the Orientalist painters had been trained in the French academies um, Typically, Orientalist painters were very academic. They'd gone through all the right steps to be painters um, and they were very well trained. Whereas the Impressionists, their whole thing was that they hated academic painting. They left the academy. They didn't exhibit in academic um, venues. So yeah, these are two very different painting styles. Um, the the whole thing about orientalism is that it's it's like hyper real almost and actually um speaking about um hyper reality actually brings me on to the next point which is that what art historians um in the last 50 years or so have started saying is that it's so hyper real because it's actually unreal all of these orientalist paintings do not depict the reality of Middle Eastern life. And this kind of um, started um, this, this whole debate about Orientalist painting. Um, and the debate mainly centered around this image that we're going to see here. So this was um, an image uh, that was analyzed by a very um, famous art historian. She's most famous for her feminist art history, but actually she wrote this really, this article that really shook the art historical world, if you can say that. Um, and it was called The Imaginary Orient. And her name is Linda Nochlin, because I'm 
don't think I've said her name. And basically she argued, and actually she proved that um, Orientalist paintings were complete fantasies. Even though they look really realistic and academic, um, they were a total pastiche, which is basically like a collage of lots of different elements, lots of different photographs put together at random. So this painting that we're looking at, the snake charmer, the tiles are taken from Turkey. Uh, the floor is taken from a complete other part of the Middle East. Uh, the clothes are taken from a different region and everything basically comes from um, wherever the artist wants and they put it together in this big pastiche to make it look as beautiful and romantic as possible. Um, and what Linda Nochlin said is that often these pastiches didn't, these kind of fantastical collages didn't really do any favours to the Middle East because often um, they perpetuate stereotypes that continue to live on today. This is kind of where they stemmed from. Um, this idea of exoticism, uh, nudity. Um, and one of the things that she really noticed was that Orientalist paintings, even though they're incredibly beautiful um, and really well painted, the architecture is often decaying. So you can see in the corners, um, you can see in this corner, for example, Again, terrible reproduction. Um, and on the tiling, on the floor, you can see um, at the bottom, everything is kind of slightly broken. Um, and it perpetuated this idea that um, these nations were decaying in some way, or which had kind of political undertones of nations that needed to be saved, i.e. colonized. Um, so all of these uh, stereotypes can really be traced back to Orientalist painting. This was Linda Nochlin's argument. Um, and it wasn't just Linda Nochlin's argument. Um, it was also the argument of um, Edward Said, who wrote a book in 1978, 100 years after this painting was made. Um, and I, I have a quote actually in my notes, which I should say. Um, let me find it. Yeah, um, so this is Edward Said's argument about Middle Eastern colonization and the kind of literature and painting and advertising that emerged in Europe alongside colonization. So he says, throughout their imperial, colonial and then neo-colonial eras, Western powers used their domination to impose a simplistic view of the East a sensual, corrupt, devious, lazy, tyrannical, and backward. So this was his um, this was his argument, and he actually used the painting that we're looking at on the front cover of his book. So he obviously thought that this painting really represented um, this uh, beautiful but negative fantasy in the best way. Um, so. Anyway, this was Linda Nochlin's argument about painting and one of the types of painting that best fits her argument, if you really want to um, really prove that she's right, is a sort of subsection of Orientalist painting called harem painting. Harems were um, bathing houses that existed in North Africa, um, in some parts of Egypt and Syria, and also in Turkey. Um, and they were typically very beautiful inside, um, and, um, and they were also, uh, female only spaces for sure. Um, I'm just going to pause and let the sound catch up because I think some people are having trouble with sound. So let me check. I'm not muted. Okay. Can everyone hear me now? I will just let people. Okay, great. So the sound seems to be back. Um, so yeah, we'll continue talking about harem paintings. So, so let's see. Um, there was so. Uh, I'm just looking at my at my notes on this. I, I was just writing about the fact that there are so many of these paintings. Um, of harems in Orientalism. 
that you would really think that they exist in every Middle Eastern culture on the corner of every street. Um, they were the complete obsession of Western painters. Um, they loved the idea of this bathing house. Uh, okay, still having problems with the sound, so. How about now? I'll just be patient and wait for people to catch up. Much better sound. Okay, great, people can hear me now. I did a mute unmute thing, so hopefully it should work. So, um, so yeah, harem paintings. The, um, the reason why they fit Linda Nochlin's arguments so well is because, like I just mentioned, they were women-only spaces. So even though there are thousands of Orientalist paintings of harems painted by men, they actually would never have been allowed to see a harem. They never would have gone inside. So when you look back at this painting by Delacroix of three women in a harem in Algeria, um, you might think differently about um, whether this is realistic or not, considering that you now know that he actually was never allowed to go inside a harem. So um, this was Linda Nochlin's point, basically, that Orientalist painting um, gave you all these fantastical ideas about the Middle East um, that ultimately created slightly negative stereotypes um, about this kind of exotic bathing culture that was, um, you know, really over sensualized. So this was her argument. I will, um, I will give you the other side of the debate, the people who disagree with this argument, even though it's quite clear <laughs> what side I, I fall on, but, um, but it's an interesting debate. So I will um, give you both sides. Um, before I do this image on the screen that we're looking at now, has reminded me um, that I wanted to mention that you might notice that um, it's worth noting that you, you might see that lots of Orientalist paintings, especially in the harem, in the bathing house, juxtapose really, really white-skinned women with black women. And it's like a repetitive thing that you'll always see in Orientalist paintings, even in this really early one. Um, I can see that I've actually written 1934 on the screen but it's 1834 so I'll have to change that. Um, <laughs> I always get the dates wrong. But um, art historians have started to write about this, about representations of race in Orientalist paintings because basically um, a lot of the harem paintings are from the Ottoman Empire in Turkey and it is certainly true that in the Ottoman Empire and in lots of the territories they conquered, like Syria and Egypt and, I mean, everywhere. Um, they had bathing houses and they also had eunuchs. And eunuchs were like slaves slash servants who had specifically, if they were men, been castrated so that they could work really, really cl closely with the Sultan without being a threat to him because they couldn't have any family or dynasty or anything. Um, so there were eunuchs, and eunuchs were sometimes black if they were slaves who had been taken from the African continent, um, but they were also sometimes white if they had been uh, from Eastern Europe, for example, where the Ottoman Empire also had territories. Um, but the interesting thing about European Orientalist paintings is that when they depict eunuchs, so these kind of um, servant figures in the harems, they almost always depict them as black. So they don't show any of the racial diversity of the Ottoman Empire. They, they have this very kind of repetitive trope, um, this repetitive division between black and white. And art historians are now saying that this is because that fitted better with um, European um, ideas about race and racism, which they, created, well not created, which they kind of took mainly from the slave trade. Um, so this kind of um, was really trying to be palatable to like a white European audience. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting point because you see it in so many Orientalist paintings. Um, 
so yeah, the other side of the argument. Going back to Linda Nocklin, I'll just briefly summarize um, that in her point of view, Orientalist paintings um, didn't portray the reality of the Middle East. They kind of simplified it. Um, they made it often look quite broken and decrepit, um, even though it still looked very beautiful. Um, they often focused on the most different and also the oldest elements of Middle Eastern culture, which ultimately, which ultimately, sorry, made it look a bit medieval. Um, and actually, the reason why I included the image on the right, the coffee house from 1888, um, is because this is a really unusual Orientalist painting, simply because of the fact that it includes a newspaper. Um, and this is one of the things that Linda Nocklin points out, is that Orientalist paintings never include newspapers, and they really don't. And she has a list of other things that they don't include, like cars, uh, or televisions, or actually, I'm not sure when the television was invented, but basically any modern invention of the late 19th century, which is tons of them because we're in like the late industrial revolution era, they are not included in Orientalist paintings. You will only see like the oldest China and the oldest, um, you know, smoking devices and instruments. So it was really kind of making the whole thing look quite medieval. Um, anyway, that's Linda Nocklin's argument. Um, someone's just asked a really good question of what the term Orientalist painting really means. Um, Orientalist painting, um, according to Linda Nocklin and Edward Said, is basically um, painting that was produced in the 19th century after the beginning of Middle Eastern colonization um, and for them it is this really specific it has geographical connotations and also historical connotations so you're in uh, North Africa in the Middle East and you're in the 19th century and the reason why um, it's so specific for them is because they think it's so directly connected to uh, colonial politics of the time so typically when people spell Orientalism with a small o, like if they just say this Oriental vase, for example, um, if it's spelt with a small o, then it's typically from the kind of 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, um, really before colonization started, because there has always been cultural exchange, you know, uh, people had been traveling before they started colonizing. So there were vases and tapestries made in Europe that were maybe inspired by Chinese art or inspired by the Ottoman Empire. And they can be called Oriental with a small O. But for Linda Nocklin and Edward Said, Orientalist painting with a big O really means a very specific style and tendency that developed when colonialism started. So I did say that I was going to give the other side of the debate some airtime. So I really should, because otherwise I never, <laughs> I never will. Um, so some art historians have said that, you know, we focus too much on the colonial history behind um, Orientalist painting, and that we should note that they show, Orientalist paintings show this great, uh, admiration and respect for Middle Eastern cultures and in particular there's one historian uh, John Mackenzie who says that this is because the industrial age was making people really nostalgic in Europe and therefore they were looking um, they were looking to kind of um, they were looking to find something uh, to inspire them to inspire more arts and crafts for example um, and it certainly is true that you can, you know, find something very beautiful and something can be full of admiration for a culture. And yet it's still very much part of the colonial context. Um, so, you know, these, these things aren't mutually exclusive. Um, I will just read you um, something by uh, John Mackenzie, just like I read something from Edward Said. These are like the opposing sides. So according to John Mackenzie, quote, he said, 
Of course, these highly positive responses to the architecture and arts of the Islamic world were not the whole story. Of course, there are texts in which the Islamic world was denigrated. It is unquestionably the case that a sense of racial exclusiveness and superiority often lay at the heart of the imperial ideology of the age. But, but, Asian and Middle Eastern people were often presented as superior to many indigenous people. And the fact is that the arts reveal the manner in which the East offered inspiration at a whole variety of levels. Many Western commentators were obsessed with a sense of decline and the East was viewed as an example of design excellence and craftsmanship. Perhaps it is time to restore the word Orientalism with a big O to its more positive meaning. So this is his side of the debate. Um, and actually, if you did really want to look into this debate, a good place to start would be the catalogue of the British Museum's um, the British Museum's, what was it called, Inspired by the East exhibition, um, which I think it closed really recently. Um, that's actually where this essay is taken from. Lots of people um, criticised the exhibition because they said that it didn't include enough information about the colonial history of the 19th century, about that turning point where Europe starts trying to colonise the Middle East um, you know, lots of people were saying, how can you talk about Delacroix and his Orientalist paintings without stating the fact that he was sent on a colonial mission um, to Algeria? So it's very interconnected. So, but nonetheless, the catalogue of the exhibition um, has essays that really fall into, um, that really give you a good sense of the debate. So, um, yeah, and lots of people are commenting on the skill of these paintings, which is absolutely true. They are, um, they're really, really well painted, honestly, like technically they are really amazing. And the other thing about these paintings is that they're absolutely beautiful. Um, and actually one of the things that has really thrown uh, the debate about Orientalist painting and what it means and what it represents is the fact that these paintings, um, in the 21st century are extremely popular in the Middle East and the main um, sales that happen at auction houses um, of Orientalist paintings often go to Middle Eastern buyers who really admire these works and that is because they are um, absolutely beautiful but um, Linda Nochlin's point about taking them uh, with a pinch of salt or at least always remembering that they are fantastical and um, very much of a colonial context kind of still stands. Well, I guess everyone would, would have their own opinion about it. So I wanted to include as well um, this painter, Osman Hamdi Bey, who is a, well, who was a Turkish painter, um, who basically really, again, you know, speaking of uh, Middle Eastern, you know, contemporary Middle Eastern buyers who really admire Orientalist painting. This is a um, 19th century Turkish painter who really admired Orientalist painting. And he actually started painting in the same style as Jerome. Um, however, um, what um, art historians have pointed out is that if you compare his paintings with Jerome's paintings or other kind of typical harem paintings of um, that fall into Orientalist painting, there are certain key differences. Um, for example, um, he often includes um, Arabic script that is that actually spells something um, because this was the thing about Orientalist painting. Often they had these kind of um, Arabized letters that didn't actually spell anything. It was all fake. Um, so you can see at the back of this painting that he includes text. Um, he also includes um, very often uh, reading and the Quran, which is actually quite absent from Orientalist painting. You don't often see people reading. So the idea is that Osman Hamdi Bey, because he's representing his own culture, actually gives you a much more um, intellectual um, perception of 
uh, Turkey in particular. So this is another one where you can see um, a woman reading uh, and reading the Quran actually, which is a uh, very unusual um, compared to the kind of harem scenes that we've seen where women are portrayed as um, kind of nude models and nothing else. So his paintings are really interesting. Um, and then another interesting thing about Orientalist painting, I mean, there's so many interesting things about it, but another one I had to mention is the fact that you get um, lots of women Orientalist painters, European women Orientalist painters. Um, finally, in the history of art, you know, women are um, starting to take part in bigger numbers. Um, and that's because like colonialism basically was a huge, uh, well provided huge opportunities for European women um, because they were allowed into harems and they were seen as like having this privileged position where they could get information about women from the colonies. So they were suddenly sent on colonial missions. They were allowed to be journalists and painters. Um, so you see uh, Orientalist paintings by European women. And at first, art historians started to say that, um, you know, potentially European women had this kind of more favorable view of the Middle East, that they didn't perpetuate so many of the stereotypes that the men did, that they had a kind of more domestic, um, more authentic view because they were allowed into the harems. There's another one here. Um, but now this argument is seen as like a little bit old fashioned because actually all of the women painters had different um, approaches and actually, well, actually ultimately really perpetuated the same stereotypes as the men. Um, and it was kind of like a trade off um, there. They was liberated uh, along the lines of gender, but only if they sort of participated in uh, this colonial context and took part in like racial subordination. So they had to kind of, um, you know, be freed from one by perpetuating a different negative hierarchy. So um, it's a really complicated thing to explain, but the, the point is that European women um, did really take part in this. Um, and it wasn't necessarily always in a positive um, way, for sure. Especially if you read their travel diaries and the literature that they produced, um, it becomes clear that they, yeah, they, they really, really took part in cultivating um, Orientalist tropes that would then become uh, stereotypes about the Middle East that we still continue to see today. So, you know, I don't want to you know, end like on a super negative um, note about Orientalist painting because actually um, there are now um, lots of uh, women artists and artists who are trying to um, grapple with the legacy of Orientalist painting um, and one of these artists is Leila Sayidi. There should be a Y in her name, so um, that's a typo. Um, but she is from Morocco, and she basically um, she makes these amazing stage sets, um, you know, by hand. So just looking at how intricate this is, you can you can see how long it takes her to put these things together. Sometimes it takes her years to stage a photograph. Um, so she manipulates every detail and then she photographs herself inside. And by doing this, she basically hopes to like take Orientalist painting to its extreme, like almost parody how constructed and fabricated they are in order to make people always remember that these paintings are put together like a collage. They aren't, they aren't a snapshot of reality. They aren't like a photograph. Um, and another thing that she often does in her work is to include lots of calligraphy, um, readable, authentic calligraphy, to kind of um, parody the fact that Orientalist painting often has fake calligraphy inside of it. Um, so yeah, it's 
it's really worth looking at her work and her stuff was included in the British Museum exhibition at the very end if anyone went um, so yeah you will notice that we haven't spent I mean any time <laughs> talking about Spanish Orientalist painting um, but that is on purpose because basically what happened with Spanish Orientalist painting is that it was totally left out of this debate. Um, you know, hopefully you can see from this class that the debate is ongoing, that um, there's so many different elements of Orientalist painting that art historians have discussed, but one of the things that nobody discussed was Spain. Um, and that's because Spain was like, basically seen to have this really different, exceptional relationship with the Middle East that just didn't fit um, the debate. And even Edward Said believed this. And I think I actually wrote like a final quote. Yeah. This is something that Edward Said wrote about Spain. He said, um, I said very little about the extremely complex relationship between Spain and Islam, which certainly could not be characterized simply as an imperial relationship. Spain is a notable exception in Europe because what provides the richness of the image of Islam in Spain is the fact that it forms a substantial part of Spanish culture rather than being an external and distant power that Spain must defend itself against. So this was the idea um, that people had that Spain uh, couldn't couldn't perpetuate the same stereotypes because Islamic culture had formed part of Spain. Um, and we looked at this last week when we did the Nazrid um, jewellery, for example. But basically, um, you know, and it is certainly true looking at the image that you see on the screen, that Spanish artists um, started painting their own, their own history. They didn't just travel to Turkey and paint whatever. They, they did, you know, specifically look back to the Nazrid period. And here you've got a painting of... Um, of Boabdil, who was the last uh, Spanish ruler. And here you've also got another painting um, of a Nazarid court where, um, you know, Andalusia is painted as like the hub of science, literature, um, music. You've got scientists on the right hand side, musicians on the left hand side. You know, this is a super uh, positive painting, I suppose. And you even have. Um, Spanish um, rulers of the day um, commissioning Orientalist uh, rooms, Orientalist? Oriental rooms in their palaces, which to be honest was happening across Europe. But this one specifically, which is Spanish, um, had um, instead of Arabic calligraphy, it had um, the um, initials II. Um, all along the side and that was basically the Queen of Spain at the time making this connection between herself and Isabella the first who had reconquered Spain from the Nazareth um, Empire so it was like they really were reviving um, their history so their Orientalism I suppose was more kind of local and specific however 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 it must, you know, it has to be said that the things that they were reviving were often not necessarily just to do with the Nazareth Empire, but actually to do with their conquest of it. So if you look at this one, um, this is a painting of the last Nazareth king leaving. And this was the thing for Spain is that it was important for them to show that they conquered this Islamic kingdom because they themselves, if we go to this slide, were actually trying to conquer it again. Um, you know, they were part of the scramble for Africa and they did invade Morocco in 1859 in the Spanish-African War. So actually, even though um, they were reviving their own history slightly differently to France, they were doing it for the same kind of colonial um, reasons. Um, and lots of politicians at the time were using this rhetoric and saying, you know, in 1857 or whatever, just before the war, um, saying things like, Spain is more entitled to colonize Morocco than France, our greatest competitor,
because Spain um, has been Islamic, Spain has been African, you know, making all of these generalizations to kind of further their colonial pursuits. Um, so yeah, Spain's sudden revival in the 19th century of their Islamic history after centuries of repressing it um, was timely and again was connected to the colonial context. So more and more Spain is being included in this debate. So it is worth um, looking at some more Orientalist paintings from Spain. I just wanted to include, to finish, this painting by Dali. Um, we can always trust Dali to do a historical painting about Spain, even though he's not known for his history painting. There'll always be one that fits whatever piece of Spanish history you're talking about. Um, and this is the Battle of Tetuan, which was the Spanish-African War. Um, and I'm just including this photograph here so that you can see how big it is. Um, it's huge, this painting. And super rare, like really difficult to get an image of because it's actually in Japan. So I, I learned this this week. Um, so, yes, um, I said I would talk for less time and I can't believe it's seven o'clock so <laughs> do feel free to start asking questions or tell me what you think on the chat or privately um, about this debate. I will leave you with these kind of Spanish Orientalist paintings to show you that um, there are very violent Spanish Orientalist paintings that have the same like stereotypes about um, the violence of Islamic kingdoms that a lot of Orientalist paintings um, focus on. Um, but you also get um, much more portraiture in Spanish Orientalism, which I will let you all make your minds up about. So yeah, I think I will leave it here because I've really um, probably given too much information, but um, I would love to know what you all think about this debate because um because it's yeah it's ongoing um and part of the reason why it's ongoing is because the paintings are so beautiful that people are really obsessed with them and we want to um make sense of them so um it is certainly possible to admire them and find them problematic at the same time um but yeah it's important to talk about them because i just think it's a part of history that really gets um, missed out. And even in galleries and stuff, when you walk through room by room, um, the Orientalist paintings will often get mixed in with other stuff, like mixed in with the Impressionists or mixed in with like realist paintings in the early 19th century, um, when they really deserve like a whole section um, to themselves so that people can spend time thinking about this debate. Um, yeah, so let me know what you think. I'll just check the chat to see if, if anyone um, has any inf uh, questions. Lots of people saying that they will look at the British Museum exhibition. Um, yeah, I really recommend um, especially because like the, the British Museum exhibition started in the 15th century. So it gives you that sense of the transition from cultural exchange to colonial exchange and how, um, how there was that moment of change when the power dynamics shift and stuff. Um,